Our video begins in the year 1700 CE. The year 1700 starts with by far the most populous two empires of the time existing on the eastern and southern coasts of Asia in the form of the Qing and Mughal empires. These two great empires combined to house around 45% of the Homo sapiens living at the time, and they also dominated in industrial capacity, outstripping even what their percentage of global population would suggest in their manufacturing production. In this first video exploring great empires from 1700 to 1815, under consideration are these two, the Qing Empire and the Mughal Empire, along with a brief consideration of the Maratha. Like, subscribe, support links in description. We're in. The Qing Empire entered 1700 having only recently, in 1683, begun the High Qing Era, the peak of the dynasty's political, military, and social power, which would run all the way through 1799. The High Qing era began midway through the reign of the longest formally ruling emperor in China's history, the Kangxi Emperor who brought prosperity and stability after chaotic times. In 1703, Lobzang Khan assassinated the Dalai Lama and was appointed regent of Tibet by the Kangxi Emperor. Tibet was then invaded in 1717 by the Jenger Khanate and they killed Lobzang Khan and took over Lhasa. The Qing came back and expelled the invaders in 1720 and established Qing rule over Tibet, which added a nice hunk to the empire. Emperor Kangxi was succeeded upon his 1722 death by one of his sons, Yinzhen, the Yongzhen Emperor. The Yongzhen Emperor pushed for Manchu elites to preserve their identity and ways of worship, and he largely outlawed Christianity. He also cracked down on financial corruption which saw 1730 bringing in nearly double the revenue to the treasury than what was brought in in 1721. Though these attempts at corruption crackdowns were relatively successful, they were far more successful in the north than in the south. The Yongzhen Emperor died in 1735, likely due to poison. Bao, son of Yongzhen, succeeded him as the Qianlong Emperor, and in the mid-18th century he embarked on the Ten Great Campaigns, campaigns including military expansion, taking control of Mongolia and Xinjiang, and putting down numerous rebellions. Later in his reign, corruption grew, in part thanks to the Qianlong Emperor relying increasingly on corrupt officials, particularly the highest-ranked minister, Hessian. A major cultural accomplishment achieved under Qianlong's occurred when he ordered the arrangement of the largest book collection in Chinese history, the Siku Quanchu. When 1796 rolled around, the Qianlong Emperor abdicated the throne, but not before the White Lotus Rebellion was underway picking up in 1794. The rebels' surprising success dampened the presumption of the monstrous superiority of the Qing army. The abdication of the Qianlong Emperor was merely ritualistic though, as he retained power for the following three years up until his death in 1799. He had merely abdicated the emperorship so as to not beat out the length of his father's reign, and so even before his death, his son Yongyan formally took his place as the Jiacheng Emperor. Taking over in 1799, the Jiacheng Emperor worked to both stem corruption from his father's later reign and to put down the act of rebellions underway at the time, successfully ending the White Lotus Rebellion in 1804. And as we cross 1815, the Jiacheng Emperor remains in power. 1700 saw the Mughal Empire under Aurangzeb. He expanded the domain, and the Mughal Empire reached its farthest extent under his reign. But by the time of his death in 1707, rebellion was occurring in multiple places with the Maratha Kingdom's independence having gotten going before 1700, and some other regions also seeing various rulers claiming independence. 88 years old at death, Aurangzeb had instructed his three sons to split the empire. Instead, they fought a battle over the succession, and Bahadur Shah rose the victor. From here on, the collapse of the Mughal Empire intensified, though most rebellions were successfully put down with the notable exception of the one led by the Sikh warrior Banda Singh Bahadur, who established his authority and the authority of the Sikh Confederacy in Punjab. 
Bahadur Shah, the Mughal emperor, died in 1712 and was succeeded by his son, Jahandar Shah, who was assassinated by his nephew Farooq Sihar's forces. Farooq Sihar was aided by the highly influential Said brothers, and he became emperor next. During his rule, he captured the aforementioned successful revolter, the Sikh Banda Singh Bahadur, and had Banda killed shortly thereafter. Farooq Siyar was deposed in 1719, and a quick succession of three more emperors under their Said regents followed in 1719. First was Rafi ud Darajat, who was sick and had his brother Shah Jahan II succeed him shortly after three months of reigning, and Jahan himself died in September of the same year. Then the Said brothers helped Muhammad Shah to power late in 1719. Muhammad Shah managed to help have the Said brothers murdered, one each in 1720 and 1722 respectively. But under his rule, the empire continued its decay and saw much conflict, including many invasions from the Maratha and their takeover of mass chunks of central India. The Mughals lost significantly to the Marathas in 1737, losing Gujarat, Malwa, and Bundelkhand, and having Delhi raided. Two years later, Delhi was invaded again and sacked by Nader Shah of Persia. The Maratha were the most significant of the powers, filling the void left by the defunct Mughal Empire. The Mughal name lived on, however, though no longer as an empire, with Muhammad Shah being succeeded upon his 1748 death by his son Ahmad Shah Bahadur, who was deposed in 1754 by Imad ul-Mulk, who placed Alamgir II on the throne and killed Alamgir II in 1759, and will now leave the Mughal story, which hadn't been an empire in decades, to take a brief look at the Maratha, who were peaking at just about this time. The Mughal story would finally breathe its last in 1858 with the deposition by the British East India Company of their last emperor in name only, Bahadur Shah Zafar, whose reign covered the mere expanse of the walled city of Old Delhi. Now for the Maratha. They had grown, peaking in 1761, at which point a Durrani invasion saw their expansion halted and their loss of control over much of North India. But their authority was re-established ten years later under the ninth Peshwa of the Maratha Empire, Madvaro I, who then died in 1722. After his death, the Maratha Empire became more a confederacy of states than an empire. The Maratha Confederacy remained a major power until the East India Company defeated them in the Second Anglo-Maratha War of 1803-1805, and then in the decisive Third Anglo-Maratha War of 1817-1819. Meanwhile, the Sikh Empire got going in 1799 under the Maharaja Ranjit Singh, who would take it through 1815. As we leave the scene in 1815, Qing China has grown some, and the Indian subcontinent sees an increasing amount of land under British control. We'll continue from 1815 on in a later video, but first, other empires of this time frame await.